Hi everybody, this is Nino and in today's video I shall present to you a system and programming language which I devised which is named EVO. It is a sort of interpreter of a kind of assembler running on a sort of virtual machine. You can compare it a little bit in its functionality, for instance, to basic interpreters or lisp interpreters or the like languages and it is it turned out to be extremely portable it is running on an arduino uno just as it is running on a mega 2560 it is running on all sorts of microcontrollers down to the uh, 80 tiny 85 which just you know 5 kilo 512 bytes of uh, ram and 512 bytes of eprom uh, and it could also be turned into a Java midlet for old phones. It runs um, just normally compiled with C on a Linux terminal. You know, it's just a console application. It does run as a Java midlet in general. Yeah, basically it's an extremely portable system which works down to very, very low uh, resource platforms. And... I would like to introduce it to you. It arose from my curiosity about very old computers. You know, like the IBM 610, the IBM 650, which by the way were the first computers at Yale. Uh, so it is something which was accessible to universities and to civilian companies which were interested in it. It was not some super complex military project. Similar computers existed like the LGP30 and uh, LGP31, the Bendix G15, the, program, the Olivetti Programma 101 and you know the like machines and as I was curious about um, such hardware it occurred to me that the style of computing was different than nowadays. Uh, in particular it was not yet figured out sort of how to do it you know in the manual of an old univac machine for instance it was described that if you move a number around in memory it was really as if it is a physical thing that you move it took the number from one memory address put it at another and the original memory address was overwritten by a zero as if you know the number has to be really removed from there Th that struck me as unusual but these times were full of such um, peculiarities and the more I looked into it, the more I believe I began to understand what it must have felt like to operate those machines. Now, for instance, you are, as a programmer, very used to the concept of having variables. What happens if you throw the variables overboard? You actually work with memory addresses directly. You do not really that much care about the variables. I know how convenient they are, but once you start look to look at memory addresses themselves, you can do a very flexible things which um, for you look very much like messy from nowadays, you know, software design principles. But at the time they were they were not implausible. That's the point. And Inspired by that, I decided to create this new language and system with this really <laughs> uh, long manual. You know, it has like 60 pages of a manual here. And uh, I'm describing there the general principles of design, the general operational principles. Uh, each instruction is described. So, yeah, please have a look at that. Uh, if you want to evaluate whether this will be useful to you. But I can outline to you the basic principles according to which uh, EVO has been designed. First of all, no, we do not operate on variables, just as I mentioned. The more interesting data entity in EVO, apart from the single memory address, is the range of addresses. It's like an array, only that you do not specify the array having a begin and an ending, but for many instructions you specify from which to which range in memory they shall operate. Memory itself is subdivided in data memory and execution memory. So program and data are not mixed. 
you you know you may have heard of this um, uh, basically the Harvard design versus von Neumann design uh, but I can tell you that separating instructions and data turned out to be a very smart decision like I understand why in the past um, computers had these two spheres separate because if you mess up anything with your instructions you will not mess up your data if you enter a datum at the wrong place you will not mess up your instructions so it's not entirely without point to keep these two worlds separate this is actually not a bad idea moreover it allowed me one m other thing instructions in EVO are entered any way you like similar uh, to a basic program. You, you give a line number, you know, and you give what shall happen in basic. And, and you can supply the line numbers 10, 40, 20, 30. It will still sort them in the correct way. Well, EVO operates similarly. It, it, it does the same. It, um, uh, you, you can enter instructions any way you like. This, this turns out to be user-friendly, actually. By default, execution memory is full of no operation equivalents. That is, um, if, if you forgot to enter some, some code there or left on purpose some space open, nothing terrible will happen. And that was another design principle of EVO, to fail late. You have fail early systems and fail late systems, where basically a fail early system, like Haskell for instance, uh, will torture you so long until everything is set up perfectly correctly and the likelihood that you have really messed up your program has become very very low. If you essentially have a wrong program in Haskell then it is because you have a conceptual error. It is because you understand your computation wrongly but it is likely not in the expression of your computation. However, these are unpleasant to work with. Like if you want to do something quickly then a fail early program will be terribly annoying because until you get anything to work at all and you know learn from your mistakes you will become old and gray so EVO is a fail late system which is trying to survive a lot of little strangenesses without uh, you know hysterically uh, stopping and uh, screaming I can't and I don't know and whatever for instance if you divide anything by zero yeah then EVO will simply give you zero. That, that's nothing to you know, get all worked out, up about. Uh, negative numbers um, can, can be taken a square root off. It doesn't give you an imaginary number, but it just simply gives you uh, the square root that's being applied on the, um, on the absolute value. And, and the like des design decisions. You know, EVO is full of such design decisions. Yeah, there you have it, that uh, if the divisor is zero, the result is set to zero on the division operation. Uh, so that's um, the essential idea of it, to, to be able to compute in a sort of batch operation way, where you set your data in memory, you set your instructions, and then you trigger computation with a jump, and then computation is performed, computation terminates, and you look at the memory contents in order to get your results. EVO actually divides um, your like its, its interaction with you into two modes, only one of them being interactive. The first mode is the order acceptance mode, and I think we now best switch to, to see the system live, where it takes your commands, and um, the other thing is the execution mode, where it actually does what you want. Uh, I think we best try that out here. Yeah, let me first show you how to compile EVO. It's really super simple. Uh, in, in Linux it works just with GCC. You say the output is EVO, you take whichever C thing you want, you link the maths library, and yeah, I had a little bit here of um, error checking if you want to. But there's really no magic to that. Uh, so that, that just is everything to give you a working EVO system. And yeah, it greets you with system ready and it asks for a command address. I'll show you some like the basic mode of interaction. Let's say the command address is zero, then it asks what operation you would like to perform. You say for instance zero, which means no operation. Then it asks you about the first data address and the second data address. These are addresses, not values. So if you would like to add two numbers, 
you are going to add the contents which are contained at the addresses thereby specified. You do not supply the numbers themselves. It's exactly one um, sort of um, case where this is violated. This is the jump instruction. In the jump instruction, you supply the the line number directly. Like if you would like to jump to line 100, like execution, uh, like command 100, like in, in the execution memory, the hundredth element of the execution memory, it would be like that. You would not just give uh, an address where the hundred is contained because I figured that that is just too incomprehensible. In, uh, a computed go to is not the best idea. At the same time, the jump instruction, the conditional jump instruction, is the only branching. Um, facility in, in this system like you you really just jump for loops you have to convert to jumps while loops you have to convert to jumps you just jump that's everything that's everything that's needed for curing completeness and I figured there's no reason why um, to go for more as some interesting design specifications which I will not get into now I'll just show you that if I want to enter no operation let's just do that uh, it's asking for an optional command I'll just give an asterisk and it told us what it did. You know, it, it executed it immediately and told us the result. Now, this system has two ways of doing computation. The one is when you are giving uh, ins instructions directly, like a calculator. Uh, this is when you're giving a command address of zero. This is not being saved anywhere. This is simply being done right now. If you give a positive command address, it will assume that you would like something to be done uh, as a part of a larger program. Uh, if um, the commands run out, you know, it will execute the commands one by one. If the commands run out, it will just get a long string of no operation until uh, the memory is exhausted and it returns you to here. For instance, if we would... Um, let, let us say the oh yeah, input and output, maybe I should say something about that. All input and output to the EVO system is entirely numeric. Uh, you can write here a bit comments and things with text, but in general that's purely optional. What you really need in order to tell the system anything to do are answers to those four questions. At what address, that's like the line number in BASIC, you would like what operation to be performed based on which two data addresses. The result is commonly placed in the first data address, as you may um, be used to from, you know, um, Intel 8086 or Intel 8080 before that assembler code. You know, like for instance, add a AX, BX will give you the result in AX. So that, that's how it works. You, you add two numbers, the first number is changed. Now what happens if you give a negative command address? You might ask yourself. The negative command address is obviously pointless because you can't have a negative line number. So that's a convenient way to implement, uh, you know, user interaction extras. For instance, uh, like the, you can check the documentation for the fur, full version, but for instance, minus four allows you to enter data. And it is asking you from where to where shall it enter something. Let's say from data address one to data address two. And it is asking you what do you want at one. Let's say, I don't know, let's say seven. And at data address two, let's say eleven. Uh, and that's it. You know, so you just entered two pieces of information. Uh, as opposed to BASIC, which I find actually a rather compatible system in uh, many ways, this does not use variable length uh, instructions. Everything you do is really just command address, operation, data address one, data address two. And everything else is sort of in a very fixed way, as if you're filling out a stencil. This makes implementation very simple and uh, increases portability very much across all sorts of systems. For instance, and this you will see in the end of this video, I could turn the system into a midlet for old mobile phones. Now, old mobile phones have as a keyboard a numeric keyboard. You don't actually have uh, an easy facility to enter letters. So when you're having something like basic, basic with its nice, you know, input and read and print and whatever, you really need to print out these things. This is not, not easy to do on a tiny crappy keyboard. 
whereas this is um, really offering you a fast way of interacting, focusing just on numbers. Normally on microcontrollers and so on, this operates over the serial port, with exception of the ESP8266, and I assume the ESP32 will work the same, where you also have a wireless possibility to do that. But evidently, as you really just need numbers to interact, you, you could really build your own very reduced keyboard. You could use one of those 4x4 keys keyboards, or these 12 keys keyboards. It, it will work just fine. Now anyway, we have entered here the number 7 and the number 11. Let's demonstrate you the immediate computation. So immediate 0, we don't want this to be done later, we want it to be done now. Uh, operation 9, that's an addition, okay? Uh, uh, and on which data pieces? On piece 1 and 2. Now, what's the funny part? When I now um, let this be done, let's just put an asterisk for us command, when this is done, then the first data address will no longer contain 7, but it will contain 18, right? So let's try that. Okay, it did it. Not very spectacular, right? So we're now saying minus 2, which is showing data. Minus 4 is entering data, minus 2 is showing it. From where till where? Let's say from 1 till 2. Uh, they'll be listed anyway on one line. And there you have your 18, you know. Uh, I, I list here in the C version everything in scientific notation because you know this looks so mainframey. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you could of course adjust that according to your taste. Uh, I try to keep that in, in the microcontrollers as well as far as practicable. Though some platforms I tell you are really difficult to handle. In particular the 80 tiny 85 where this runs too with a much redu reduced set of um, operations but it does run. Uh, and, and midlets, Java midlets, because they don't have floating point operations. You, you operate with fixed point, which means you set aside a few uh, positions in your number and you say this is to be assumed behind the um, decimal point. And you have essentially the same operations as usually, only that for multiplication and division you need to adjust um, the, the, the places, you know, because uh, when, when you mul multiply the numbers, they become too large and you need to shift them a bit to the right and for division you need to prepare them a little bit to the left, so um, basically you have a bit of an adjustment for multiplication and division and fixed point. Uh, but normally it is uh, the, the universal data unit in this system is the floating point number. EVO operates on nothing else, that's its sole data type, the, the floating point number or fixed point number. because I did not want to create another system like Integer Basic. You know, I found these systems always so ridiculous. So we really think that I can only operate on whole numbers or should take care of everything myself. I mean, do you, do you find that realistic? When people want to do computations, they commonly need to work with numbers which are not integers. Anyway, we added the numbers, we got our result of 18, you know. And now let's show you as opposed to that an actual program of just one instruction. We will now say that we want to subtract the numbers. We want to subtract uh, from position one, the number uh, at position two, you know, 18 minus uh, 11. So that should give us the seven here again. And now we will not say zero, we will say one, because the command address is one, one instruction, right? Then we will say the operation will be 10. 9 was minus, 10 is plus. The documentation lists all of them. There are 63 all in all, whereby the 63rd one is considered to be implemented by the user if he wants to have anything there. It's reserved, so to say. So, command address 1, this is like line number 10 in basic or something, you know. Then, data address 1, data address 2. So that's it. That, that's our program. And I will see something interesting. While it accepted it, uh, it does not actually execute it. If we now look again at the uh, data, nothing has changed. This has not turned into 7. Th this did not yet compute it. Why? Because it was not an immediate instruction. It was a program instruction. Only when you say that you would like to execute it, does it actually do anything. How do you execute things? With a jump. Okay? With an immediate jump. Your instruction is now 
um, you know, zero. This is an immediate instruction. The jump operation is one. The data address one it requires is zero. I'll explain that. The jump is always conditional. And it is conditional upon the idea that a data address contains a zero. Like, if this would be, you know, five, then the jump would happen if data address five contains a zero. Now, data address zero itself is also reserved, and it is considered to always have to contain a zero. So, your programs start at one, your data starts also at one, because data address zero contains a zero. If you say that a jump shall happen if zero contains zero, then it becomes an unconditional jump. You just jump always. Okay, and where shall we jump to? Spectacularly, data address, uh, no, execution address one. This, however, is where our um, program is contained, our one instruction program, which will now, uh, you know, on command address one, it will subtract the numbers at data address one and two. Okay, we do that now, and it did it. Uh, I'll go, uh, I'll explain a little bit about this run limit just in a second. Let's look at uh, our data, did it do anything? We list from one till two, and ta-da, you are having your seven here. Okay, so you see basically how this is working. Obviously the, con the program can get a lot more involved, and I will show you such demonstrations on the AT tiny AT5 because this is what you're truly curious about and on the Java midlet. Now perhaps a few words about the run limit. When the program runs uh, you might have made a mistake and you might have an infinite loop. Now what do you do? If you reset the system you are certain to lose your data. So that can be unpleasant, right? So for that reason, the system has by default something which I call a run limit, which is essentially a countdown counter, which is checking how many operations have been already performed. And if a certain limit has been transgressed, operation is terminated and you're informed uh, that it did not end, but was uh, aborted. So Alan Turing, how do you like that as a solution to your halting problem? problem yeah? It halts at some point definitely. Uh, that means that if you actually have a bug, you just you know wait a few seconds or maybe a minute or something, and the system will stop by itself, and you have all the chance in the world to correct your mistake without losing everything you did before. As to losing things, maybe I should mention here a few things too. You see, I was particularly tempted by microcontrollers which have EEPROM. This is a sort of memory which can be written to and it can be read, but it gets used up. It's a bit like Flash in that regard. It's just much older than Flash. And Arduinos commonly have EEPROM and most um, programs actually don't make any use of it. Well, EVO does. Namely, the, all the instruction memory is kept in EEPROM. The entire SRAM, like the volatile memory, is for data. My assumption here was that you will want to rather keep your programs than your data if anything happens, because it was the programs which were hard to assemble, and the data is usually something you can quickly re-enter and which you will rather variate. The other thing is that instructions are commonly not changed that much. You would have to uh, manually overwrite them, whereas the system will permanently read and write data. So EEPROM turns out to be not a bad thing for having uh, instructions there. It, it is a nice space for instruction memory. And something like the AT Tiny 85, which is like a good step below the Arduino Uno, uh, has 512 bytes of SRAM, but also 512 bytes of EEPROM. So by using EEPROM, not only do we have a sort of, uh, you know, fail safe if uh, we unplug it or something, but we also double our memory range. So it, I think it was a good idea to use EEPROM whenever it is available. And uh, ESP8266 um, is actually having an EEPROM emulation library, which I'm also making use of. So there you have the same effect. 
other platforms unfortunately don't have it like the C one and the Java one and in particular the midlets uh, and the ARM platform so far don't have anything like that so there you turn off the system you lose all the instruction memory whereas most microcontrollers keep the instruction memory also when you unplug them and when you plug them back in you just need to add the data okay so about the execution modes I think you saw this rather nicely demonstrated here so you always asked command address operation data address one and two so that is how you enter things this is like your basic REPL where you are entering line by line your uh, program there are certain negative command addresses which give you certain facilities to make a setup before the computation compared to old mainframes you could say that this is where you are setting up your blinking lights you know you're setting various switches at the consoles you are modifying the manner of computation uh, you do this and that and then you send it out uh, you know into open space to really execute the orders you gave the machine this I call the order execution mode. The order execution mode is not interactive. It is just doing internally some computation. And when it is done, it comes to this what you saw so far. And this I call the order acceptance mode. Uh, evidently on a modern and big machine, order execution takes just fractions of a second. It is um, extremely anticlimactic to observe. But all in all this setup with the instructions which are provided and you know they are also including sinus and cosinus and logarithms and whatnot um, this gives you a rather wide uh, ranging facility to conduct computation even on uh, weak hardware old devices and essentially uh, on most of the hardware you can get your fingers on well I believe that uh, you will be at full leisure whenever you decide it proper to read this uh, documentation if you should care about the system. And next I shall present you two demonstrations of the system in operation. One will be to compute whether a number is prime or not and for this we shall use an AT tiny AT5 and from there you can extrapolate that you can use an Arduino Uno and ARM and ESP8266 and whatever else and the other thing will be to show you the midlet variant of EVO operating on a cell phone simulator so you see that you can actually use this system also on your old cell phone that you keep lying around somewhere in your drawer and that you have no clear purpose for so without further ado here comes the AT Tiny 85 experiment. All right, everybody, let's get to the part I know you're all curious about, and that is, in fact, uh, running uh, uh, some code on AT Tiny 85. Well, that's in fact your familiar Arduino IDE under the tools we have here yeah you see that the board is the DigiSpark uh, the DigiSpark not the standard DigiSpark board just the default version of it it is a very popular core for the AT Tiny 85 type devices and while there might be some which are more economic and where perhaps one could even afford luxury such as floating point I stick to the default because this is what I assume that people will be trying because this is what the tutorials are really suggesting too so this being said I <laughs> I think there's not much more to show here than to just go to the serial port and on TTY USB 0 I have an adapter of TTL to USB logic basically and we are going to open the serial monitor and there we are when we press enter we are greeted by the command prompt now in order to spare you the whole long entering of instructions I have already entered the program 
which is also contained in the 60 pages manual, whose task it is to determine whether a given number is indeed a prime number. And we will be trying whether the number 17 is prime and whether the number 16 is prime. The algorithm works like that. It is trying to repeatedly subtract numbers from this given number. And if anywhere a rest of zero is discovered, like a complete subtraction so that nothing remains, then it means that the number is not prime, right? This comes from the fact that a prime number can only be divided by one and by itself. So if you take the number five, for instance, if you subtract from it two, then three are left. You can subtract again two and one is left and it's a rest of one. If you subtract from it three, you immediately get a rest of two. If you subtract from it four, you get a rest of one, but you do not end up with a rest of zero. If you, on the other hand, take the number six and you now subtract from it two and two and two, then really you do have a rest of zero and six is obviously not a prime number. So this is how this works. It's not exactly efficient and it could be improved in so many ways so very quickly, uh, but it is a way to demonstrate how our nice thing computes. Well, uh, without much ado, let's show you the EEPROM. The point is that this is the command for it. It's minus one, but on the 80 tiny 85, you need to put the minus after the command and the command address, you know, afterwards. Generally, negative numbers, the minus follows. And to terminate the number, you use the asterisk. Uh, should you forget the asterisk, just enter it afterwards, you know. So let's look at what our instructions in memory look like. And I tell you, programming this thing is extremely difficult because space is extremely tight. You import the soft serial library, you import this and that, and suddenly you are left with something like three kilobytes to put your code on. This is really not funny to write an interpreter or two. I'm sure that some of you have greater talents than I do and can do this better than me. Uh, but that is my my product here and you can see on the EEPROM despite having you know removed this device and it having been you know without electricity has kept all the data as we entered it and these are the instructions they start at uh, execution address 4 and above it is a little bit of no operation and under it is again no operation. Now the instructions here are printed a little bit different than in the other platforms and that is simply again due to lack of flash space. Every time you print a string you really lose a lot and in order to not print string separators between the, in the numbers here I turned them negative first number is just normal and the other three are negative and these little minuses rather serve as separation dashes. You can compare this with the program in the you know nice 60 pager of a manual. I'll not really go into details. Just a few things you may notice there is no negative zero. So whenever something is zero you know it simply sticks together. For instance here address 27 contains a no operation that means uh, on address 27, the operator is zero and the first and second address are also zero. So this is just no operation and you see everything else is full of no operation. Um, yeah, that, that's simply a quirk I'm willing to accept, you know, it, uh, given the, the space uh, advantages it really offers me. What we now just need to enter are the data we would like to check. So, yeah. 4 minus was the command to enter data, all right, into the data address that is volatile uh, SRAM. So we're going to enter from address 1 to address 3. You know what, I'll show you something. I'll enter now the 3 without an asterisk. And you see, it's gone. The system has seen it, but it doesn't know that you have terminated your data entry. In order to show it, should you forget ever to enter an asterisk, just enter an asterisk all by itself. When you enter that, down here the 3 will appear. Watch. So, it appeared. All right. And now the system says, okay, you want to give me three pieces of data. 
which are they hmm? at the first uh, data address we will enter our number to be checked which will be 17 1700 these last two zeros on the 80 times 85 are decimal numbers so you want to you want to enter 17 you enter 1700 when you want to enter 10 you enter 1000 when you want to enter 1 you enter 100 and so on the last two zeros are simply behind the decimal point the same by the way works um, like in a similar fashion actually works the midlet which is on this uh, like most primitive style this MIDP standard 1.0 there just the zeros are four it has a higher precision this one has just a precision of two positions and yeah well we enter that, that like this uh, just we don't forget our asterisk and there are two further auxiliary variables we need to enter namely you know we don't actually need to check all the range to the number up in fact you only need to change up until it's square root because up to there you should have called the factors well, we have simplified it here by saying you check up to half the number right so these 200 are just two in order to divide 17 by two uh, then we are going to uh, show also one this is uh, each number being checked like increasing it by one you also notice this is also not algorithmically optimal because well you don't need to check any even numbers right nothing divisible by two can possibly be prime but um, the, these are certain optimizations which I simply did not want to get into because I don't want to show you something algorithmically perfect rather I would like to show you something which um, shows a lot of action you know because you want to see the 80, uh, 80 tiny 85 doing something like right why are we paying it for let's get a show so that's it and now we trigger the program it actually starts at uh, command address 4 but because everything is full of no operation once you clear the memory you know uh, you can jump any address before that and just glide towards that there is one exception, you know, actually in, in a bigger microcontroller with lots of EEPROM, you might wish to hold several programs uh, at once in execution memory. And how do you do that? Well, you, you keep one in address, I don't know, 1 to 50, one is somewhere from 50 to 120, another one is from 121 till 300, whatever, something like that. And they all jump in the end to the final execution address that is they over jump all other programs and everything terminates just normally and that way by selecting the ent entry address you can actually execute different programs on the same EEPROM that can work sort of like a little manual file system if you want and we do a similar trick here the final instruction of our program is really instruction 28 is a one the zero doesn't have a dash because you know it's um, zero zeros don't uh, there's no negative zero here that's not a univac from the 1950s univacs from the 1950s did have a negative zero but we're not doing that here it's just a normal 80 tiny 85 so the 28th instruction is a jump one uh, if data ad, uh, address is uh, uh, if data address zero zero which it is to instruction 63 which is the last instruction and immediately terminates computation but because there's a lot of stuff going on here uh, we should increase our run limit the run limit is the maximum number of operations which will be executed before the 80 tiny 85 stops execution it just prints here a little x and tells you you went too far that's a safety measure in case you get into an infinite loop it's rather practical trust me um, just when you want to do something more practical like more more involved you might wish to simply increase that limit which happens with minus nine uh, and it is out asking us now for the new run limit let's take something really high 30,000 right like seriously 30,000 operations should be enough uh, as a you know to, to, to get a result so it's a nice fail save here and now we can trigger execution like this command zero that means an immediate instruction like do this right now not some point later 
So on command address zero, the operation shall be a one, which is a jump. That is, we transfer control to our program. If data zero is zero, but it is supposed to always be the case, and then jump to execution position one. Uh, this is so extremely easy to memorize, you know, zero, one, zero, one, uh, like that's a really easy way to start your programs. And then while it executes, it actually immediately shows a trace of what it is doing. So it's now determining where the 17 is prime. I want to show you something funny here. Notice how nicely you can see the loops. You see, here you're seeing numbers repeat, numbers repeat. Basically, uh, this, trust me, this facility is super useful and the other platforms have a trace facility too but on the 80 tiny 85 it is simply always on by default why because i did not have the flash space to implement you turning it on and turning it off and what if it simply is always on you you execute your program you see what is happening and for debugging purposes, this really was helpful because I am terrible at assembler, including my own assembler. Well, now, enough talk, let's check did it provide us the right result. In data address 10, if this is a prime number, you know, the minus 2 here will print the data addresses, uh, and it prints them all. It is not asked here, asking here which range to print. It simply prints, prints everything because they're really just 63, you know, disregarding address zero. So instead of asking for limits and blah, blah, it just prints everything it has. And if in data address 10, there is a one shown as a 100, then it did determine that 17 is a prime number. And exactly that's what we're having here. So yes, our 80 tiny, 85 correctly determined with the EVO system that and our program on it that 17 is a prime number. Uh, you can find by the way the instructions of course in this fat 60 pages manual to this system and I leave it to you to enter them one by one there. Don't forget your asterisks. You know and then you can have some fun with this. Uh, now we tried that 17 is a prime number but let's try 16 huh? Like, is 16 a prime number? How about that? So first of all, we should clear our memory. For that, we need the command minus 6, which is entered here again with a uh, trailing minus and an asterisk. Okay, here it does not even ask you from where to where to clear. It simply clears all the data at once. Have a bit of a look at the source code of the 80 tiny 85 system before you employ it because it has a few quirks like that simplifications. You know, you, you say to clear the data, it just clears everything. It is just really all due to the lack of flash space. I just did not have any space to make it run uh, more uh, bells and whistles, as you call it. We, we now clear the data. You can have a look at that with, uh, you know, minus two. So now you see everything is zeroed out. Here, the data addresses are trailing and before that is the content of the data addresses. These are the values basically and these are the addresses. I know this looks somewhat unusual, but I'll tell you why this is so. In order to save space, I am sometimes turning numbers here negative. And when you print a negative number right after a positive number, it looks like separating them with a dash. It's just a, an optical trick and it's not because it's so great, but simply because I had no space. So that's what it looks like. The complete address range is now zeroed out. It's time for us to enter our second request. Minus four is entering data. Minus two is displaying. Minus four is entering. And we are saying we enter minus four. From which address to which? Again, from one to three. This time we're entering 1600 because we checked 1700, like 17. Now we'll check number 16. Uh, again, the auxiliary variables. And again, we are triggering our program to start with 0, 1, 0, 1, and watching it execute. And it's done quickly. It rather quickly figured out that, you know, 16 is not a prime number. Let's look at the proof of it, the proof being in the pudding. No, we don't want to enter anything. We just want to look at things. Okay, so this is the data space. We're going up. And yeah, 
Under address 10, we see no boy that is not a prime number. It's a zero, it's not a hundred or one, you know, like in the previous example. And here under 11 and 12, by the way, it tells you the first factors it found for that number, like which two numbers will give us 16 if multiplied. And yes, eight times two gives 16. So yeah, there you have it. The 80 tiny 85 can serve as a general purpose computing platform. Uh, I mean, this is a program of 24 instructions. That's not, you know, nothing. Uh, and even with minimal resources, you can have, you know, general purpose computing. I call this the smallest mainframe in the world because of the way this works, you know. It's, it's such an assembler-like language and uh, <laughs> And, and you, you, you give it orders what to do, and in a sort of batch operation it does it, and then you look at your addresses here, or punch cards, depending on how you see it, and, and you search for the results you want. Uh, I think this is very retro. This is exactly the way I imagine those hulking beasts of the 40s till 60s to have operated, you know, and uh, yeah, that's a, that's a rather pure form of computing, as, uh, as, as a gentleman once expressed. So, yeah, I hope you enjoy that, and basically, on we go with the show. All right, and now comes the funny part. You know, I made evil also into a midlet. So, you know all these old phones which people are having, which are collecting dust from who knows what year and which are still having WAP browsers and things like that and whose SIM cards are uh, not used anymore because SIM cards are smaller or not at all existing. Uh, well, these phones oftentimes still can run Java midlets. It was to my great surprise that I recently discovered that for about 10 years already phones are no longer generally running Java midlets. I don't know why, but all these new phones, I don't know, anybody is uh, putting on the market from Nokia over Samsung and ZTE and even Indian Lava or whatever these companies are all called. None of them seem to really have the capability of a Java virtual machine, which I find actually a big pity, but old phones in particular did have it. And there is a Java Midlet emulator in the Android um, market too, in, in this Google Play Store. So you can actually run that thing, which I'm about to show you also on modern phones or on very ancient phones. And you know, a little bit about my back thought here. You see, kids are oftentimes not allowed to touch any more interesting form of technology at the same time. It is exactly kids whose minds are most interested in, uh, you know, following a new paradigm of logic and thinking and who, who should be given access to this technology. So what can one do? Well, with this system, I mean, this is a fully operational system, you know, on which you can actually devise programs. You can give a kid the oldest and crappiest cell phone you can get lay your fingers on, you know. Uh, as long as it has a uh, GVM and, the, and as long as you somehow manage to get the midlet onto the machine. Now, a little bit as to how you do this whole midlet story. Uh, that was so puzzling. You know, you, you can get this Sans Wireless Toolkit 2.2. I recommend that rather than the newer ones because you can create the most primitive stuff with it. And let's be frank, the the best times for midlets were the old times, when phones got more capabilities, uh, iOS and later Android were just around the corner. So the vast majority of phones is, um, w which can run Java programs is with low capabilities. And you really just put your um, source code here under apps and uh, somewhere Oh, where was it here? No, yeah, yes, 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 we, we, I'm on the right path, right? So, for instance, here under Evo Nano, 
uh, you create a new project, it creates this main folder structure, you know, like all the stuff you see here, and you put your stuff under source. And when you build everything, when you say that the project shall be built, you'll find it here under bin. And you find a JAT file and a JAR file. And with old WAP browsers, you actually need the JAT file in order to download the JAR file. More modern phones can operate just downloading the JAR file. But my old uh, friends of Siemens, you know, the M50 and the MT50 really do need the JAT file in order to acquire the JAR file. So you, you get everything here. It's all pretty, pretty nicely done. And we will now execute it, you know, because I want to show it in this video, uh, over an emulator, which is this K emulator. Works rather nicely and works like a, you know, shows you a mobile phone, basically. Let's go full screen here. Yes. So now we will select which jar to load and it will be the one I showed you. Yeah, you, you see them here on my uh, Linux machine, but let's go. Let, let's do it as you would be doing it if you had compiled it, you know. You go in your WTK, you go into apps, you find it. Uh, where was it? Yes, the Evo Nano one, for instance. You go to the source, uh, no, to the binary, and because you don't want the source, and you load the jar file. And you know what? I don't see a thing here, so I'll have to simply say enter and hope that it will get it. Yes, it did. So that's your welcome screen. Let's see, can we see our keyboard too? Yes. And now you see the great advantage of the system being purely numerical. You have here uh, a numerical keypad. That's why I believe that BASIC as a JAR program is extremely impressive, but not all that useful because trying to you know, print a statement, you have to put and then tuk, 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 and so on. This is, this is really going to take an eternity until you write print. And uh, therefore, if you have a system whose entire instructions are compromised by what you see here uh, on the keypad, like they're comprised just out of numbers and, and very few special signs, like an asterisk and a hash sign or something, um, then, then it is actually more practicable. You're much faster entering things. And indeed, I will show you to how to enter a program which will sum up the numbers from 10 till 23. Okay, so we're saying init. This is the right soft key to, uh, key to initialize. And yeah, when you start the Evo system as a middlet, it is uh, in its welcome screen, it is printing all the commands it actually has available. So you sort of um, know what to do. I mean, all the execution commands, the data entry commands, there are a few more, but let's be frank, these are the ones you really care about. To look at your instructions, you know, minus one, to show the data and to enter the data. And then below it, you have what, uh, uh, what, what uh, operations are actually possible. So we press the right soft key to do an init. And now we are again invited to enter our numbers just just like in the other systems now there's one thing which is different about middlets from any other platform i have implemented this in middlets are so made to be interactive and when you're having such a system which is oriented towards batch operations you know you give startup values you get end values this is so infinitely annoying in particular you cannot if you have a jump, if you have a loop, which is, you know, like repeating and repeating, when you're having an interactive thing, you do not really have a way to jump back into your loop. You simply branch out to do something interactive, and then you can do something else and something else. But how the hell do you go back? You know, there is no too straightforward way to do it. Of course, you could be setting flags and skipping parts of the loop accordingly and somehow with a lot of spaghetti um, getting back to where you were. Maybe I'm just inexperienced because I like learned this uh, in a day how to do this. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's, it was unpleasant. It simply was unpleasant to program middlets. That, that is simple truth. Anyway, but this was 
at least not very difficult, you know. So how here the navigation works, it's a little bit different than in the other platforms. Basically, you go screen by screen and you press always this right soft key or wherever it is really on your screen. Uh, you can always exit and then it will tell you like to go to the first screen and exit from there. Or you can, you know, now enter something. And uh, that is how it's going to be. Like it's not a long screen scrolling like you have it on terminals but it is really screen by screen this is different from Arduino and different from the C and the Java version okay let's enter our program which will be here uh -huh. so we're going down uh, how, how do I actually do this yeah okay three <laughs> I haven't done, I, I did it once but it's not like I did it often uh, yeah enter uh, right soft key no, not enter. I actually really need to um, enter things here. Hey, you pad, are you working? Okay, this is working. Three. Oh, yes, I want a three. What's so difficult about this? Let's have a three. Can I? Can I write a three here? Yes. Okay. I'll just use a normal keyboard. This is just gonna be fast anyway. Okay. Uh, on a normal phone. Uh, by the way, the values you're seeing here, they are just so selected so that you cannot easily completely mess up things like the preset thing is to create an uh, to do an immediate operation uh, like zero operation zero which is no operation address one one and address two one so essentially you do nothing if you happen to press enter prematurely uh, you will not damage your program you will not damage your data either so that that's the whole reason why you're having these funny default values now it's showing what you entered 3641 yeah that's correct uh, and then init means initialize like do the next thing that's showing us some further information down here it's saying on um, command address 3 you entered instruction 6 which is like an assignment operation uh, for the data address 4 which is presently pointing to a 0 which is pointing to a 0 um, and the data address 1 and the decimal value of this uh, instruction would be this ridiculous number here in case you would want to enter instructions directly that's not something we commonly do right now but it might be become useful in case you really want to you know save programs in binary form i myself find it a lot more sensible to um, save each command as such a group of four numbers you know three six four one and then another four for number command. Okay, let, let's do the next one. So that this is not actually long. It's like uh, how many is it? From three till eleven. Okay. So for I, I'm just going to do this like how it would be in, in reality once you have actually planned this. The difference between this and three four. Uh, the difference between this and the Arduino, by the way, is the unpleasant fact. Uh, let's go back to init is the unpleasant fact that you do not have EEPROM. In other words, that's the one unpractical thing about the middle it, is that when you turn it off, it is really off. It does not um, it does not save for later what was being done. This is not only its advantage, like I could of course have figured out to save numbers in a text file, right? This would not be too difficult. but then you would need access to the file system huh and then the question for me is how is that going to work because different phones implement access to the file system in different ways in particular Sony Ericsson's are asking you for every little thing it reads from the file system it becomes quickly extremely annoying and in reality unusable so I devised it would be better to keep my middle at the lowest common denominator that is to not use the file system at all so in this case it was a bit of a design decision more than an impossibility of doing it but people have written incredibly nice middle which are incredibly annoying to use on certain phones apart from that by the way Sony Ericsson's I really liked them I find it a pity that uh, <laughs> that the, the classic phones basically no longer exist but I understand the onslaught of Android and iOS uh, is not something you can easily oppose but on the other hand I must really say I find it a pity that even modern dump phones or feature phones or whatever you call this 
uh, don't actually have a Java virtual machine. Like they turn out to be worse phones than you know ten years ago. A three five five. Okay. So and that's how you would enter a program. I, I tell you, I have been doing this on on a phone from two thousand two, uh, and it did exactly that. Uh, Todo, yes, it is exactly the M fifty type you know that I used for the experiment and yes the M50 does does work so 9151 yes and two further instructions since we're done uh, we're going to say here 10104 by the way this program uh, there is one special thing here about the middlets because interactivity of operation is a little bit just given in the general user interface but it is difficult for the program itself um, I ditched the the dynamic input and output instructions basically you just set your data in the beginning of the run then you run the program and then you look at the memory how it has changed and that is your only way of input and output. These input and output commands which some other platforms have available are not available here because it was just way too annoying to code this uh, with such a super interactively oriented interface. For me, some other people might actually like doing that and I indeed hope that those who, who have more abilities than myself will uh, improve the system you know now let's look at our instructions right let's enter minus one this is the command to look at things and it's telling you from where to where would you like to see let's say from one till twelve we have entered only from three till eleven so we should see a little bit of no operation see list instruction range so we click it and there we go one and two and no operation this is a six Three six four one. Yeah, that's a correct. Then we are having a four nine one, and here again three four nine one three correct. A and that's actually how it goes. You know, like you you can go there instruction by instruction, and I will do exactly that. Five nine four one correct. Six six five two correct. Seven ten five one correct. 8355 five, correct 91511 five, correct 10104 oh, correct and 11344 four, also correct okay great mm, now we can again just like in the other program jump to the execution we say uh, as an immediate command we want operation 0 that is a jump if data address 0 is 0 jump, which it will be, then jump to address 2. Ah, no, haha, <laughs> we cancel this. We don't do this because. Uh, yeah, we have not yet entered our data. Haha, <laughs> sorry, forgot that. So we are having here minus 4 in order to enter data. And we will just need to enter 3 pieces of data. Like in what range? Well, in the range of 1 to 3. From data address 1 till data address 3 yeah and now we will say set okay do so it's asking us for the first number it will be you know this is a very primitive middlet so we're going to say 10,000 this is again a fixed point number the last four zeros are the be behind the decimal point so this is really 10 this is not 100,000 Okay, 100,000 would have more zeros. The four zeros, so like four places of precision behind the decimal point, is what um, this has available. You might ask yourself why. Oh, I will tell you. It is because uh, the first version of Midlets, sensationally, did not have floating point. You know, who this luxury of having fractional numbers? Yeah, so that is it. We're going to enter the number, we're going to add the numbers from 10 to 23. So we entered our 10, we're entering our 23, and we're going to pro progress in uh, steps of 1, just, just like that. Okay, and now that's it. 
we're done and we now we can say our 0101 right in order to start execution so 0101 and when we now enter this is our last moment to actually abort uh, execution yeah if you abort execution you will not be thrown out of the middle but it will just not do anything however if you now say run it will do it and that's what we want it to do bah! it took so quickly to compute all of those numbers on my modern computer haha <laughs> yeah well excellent uh, now uh, th that was all yeah like if this was not spectacular enough I'm very sorry there's nothing I can do about that but we can have a look at the data hmm? this is how output is done you look at the data and you don't have to look if you don't care immediately maybe you want to do some further computations before you actually look maybe you don't care to look immediately so but we do want we, we want to see the numbers from I don't know 1 till 10 or what was it or something like that or where, where, where did, I, did I put the value there I don't even remember but let's say 1 till 10 okay fine yeah it was position 4 so here you're seeing the sum of the numbers everything else is unused so from 23 to, from 10 to 23 the sum the sum of the numbers is 231 it's operated correctly I can now press uh, the right soft key you know and I can yeah basically that's it I can exit uh, like I, I could do another program here and so on and I could um, change the data and some other things and whatever but if I just want to exit, I'll just press, press the left, so left soft key and out I am again from my midlet. Yeah, and that was the demonstration of that. Well, I pretty much hope you enjoyed it. You know, there are of course other platforms, but uh, of course I cannot show everything individually, but they work in an analogous manner. I particularly enjoy the ESP8266 and uh, the wireless variant of it because actually you can connect to your chip over your mobile phone and do your computations remotely you know it just can dial into your mobile phone and then you just have a server there uh, which is waiting with netcat and listening to an incoming connection and when this thing connects you press enter and there you are greeted by your prompt and can uh, do your computations there well anyway this thing is extremely portable as you have seen like I have a midlet I, I let it run on an 80 tiny 85 it does run on arm it does run on the Arduino Uno it runs on the mega 2560 it runs uh, of course on the dual because it is arm it runs I, I bet it will run on risk 5 and so on because really um, it keeps the core of computation as the sole important principle you enter numbers and you receive numbers and there is no fussy fancy things which you would do in the meantime so I believe no matter how low the hardware is this thing should run on pretty much anything well, and that will be the end of this video I really hope you enjoyed it and well see you next time bye bye